Greetings to one, to all, all my dudes and my dudettes. It's Stefan from a Comedy Advice Podcast, giving you a little bit of intro cheer, woo, 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 and a little hype, getting you pumped up, getting those bl that blood flowing and pumping, because you're going to have to use all your muscles, because you're going to be laughing so hard at this episode with me, of course, and my pal, special guest, Greg Proops. What an amazing guest. I have admired him from afar. Sounds super weird and creepy. Sorry, Greg. But on uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, the UK and US version, if you guys know him from that, or perhaps you didn't know him from the parts that he's played. He was the voice of Bob from Bob the Builder. Yes, that Bob, the most important Bob of all. I can't think of any other Bobs that are as, high, as highly esteemed as Bob the Builder. Also, he was in Star Wars Episode One, narrating that adrenaline-filled pod race. That was my favorite part of the whole movie, to be honest with you. And he was several voices in The Nightmare Before Christmas. And one really cool takeaway that I got from this is he quoted Oscar Wilde, because Greg Proops is the smartest man in the world, as claims his podcast and his book. Where is it? It's somewhere here. I put it on my nightstand because I'm reading those little delicious nuggets of wisdom but he quoted oscar wilde saying that oh my god here i'm gonna butcher it already but think of your weaknesses as your strengths and that's one of the reasons that he actually got on in nightmare before christmas because his voice his the texture of his voice was very adored and a lot of times people would say it's nasally and effeminate etc but i'm not gonna leak any more of these episode tidbits, you're just gonna have to listen. But before you do, first off, thank you to everybody that's been listening, leaving comments, subscribing, reviewing, giving me those support cuddles. Thank you so much for nestling me with all of your support. And I love it so much. I feel like I'm the little spoon now. You guys are just coming up behind me and wrapping those digital arms around me. And I'm feeling it, guys. I'm feeling it. I would appreciate it if you stopped breathing on my neck as you're cuddling me because I am quite ticklish around the neck area. But other than that, everything's A-OK. -okay. I love it. And I'm, I'm super here for it. And I'm here for you. Also, thank you for the comments, everybody that corrected me on last episode where I said Worcester sauce instead of Worcestershire sauce. So to all of you guys that corrected me, thank you. Also wanted to address something from the Angela Johnson episode. Some people came at me, they were like, hey, that joke about recruiters. I'm not sure, are you against recruiters? And I just wanna let everybody know it was a joke about recruiters, okay? It was a joke which stems from my vast hatred for recruiters. You guys are absolute garbage. Stop contacting me and calling me. Hey, you got a free moment? No, I don't. So stop, okay? Go recruit somebody else because I am already in the army of happiness. That, uh, the army of smiles. I am in the legion of grinning and grinning and winning is my game and what I fight for. So recruiters, just kidding. I love recruiters. I don't know why that was a thing, but love you guys. And uh, thank you for, you know, coming out and trying to clarify that. I appreciate it. And I apologize to any recruiters I may have offended. Call me sometime. We can set up some time and maybe I can uh, get you guys a employed to work for me. I don't know. Maybe you guys can recruit some guests or something do something useful with your lives. Jesus. Kidding. Recruiters, love ya. Love ya. And that's it. If you guys please support Greg Proops, give him some love, follow him, listen to the smartest man in the world podcast by his book and see him perform live. Who's live anyway, is on tour going on tour in September. And they're just going across the country. So I'll put a link in the show notes for the tour dates. Don't forget about me i'm also performing live at jp's comedy club this weekend thursday through saturday the 26th through the 28th and then also my new show trash or treasure at the house of comedy is gonna be a banging mm. it's just gonna be bumping and banging and it's gonna be all sorts of violent verbs but violent in a way that will continue to get your blood pumped got it 
So it's going to be good. It's going to be the show notes, September 8th, Lamar Mitchell, JR and I will be hosting and we will be moderating as comedians, battle it out, just fighting each other over different topics to see if they're trash or treasure. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You guys are a lot of fun. Do you know that? Look at you. You guys, you just make me beam with joy. Okay. And you know what I'm going to make beam now is the main episode. So here it goes. Hello, Greg. Hi, Stephen. Stefan. Stefan, yes. How are you? I'm doing splendid. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you so loud and so clear. Not okay, too loud, good. though. The, right. the right amount of loud. I, okay, awesome. I put a microphone right there. Oh, that's great. Love. Uh, and I also, I love the attire for today. I like the uh, leopard. It's Jaguar. all animals. It changes. It's a, it's leopard. Then it turns into a tiger. And it's from Lasky's in Memphis where Elvis got all his clothes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's, ve it's very reflective of you as well. Cause you're actor turning to uh, <laughs> improv to stand up. That's great. That's awesome. Cat of prey. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, the last time we were on tour, we played Memphis in 2019 and, uh, I was pretty excited. There was a Lasky's in our hotel. We stayed at the Peabody, which is really old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a Lasky's in the lobby and we all got stuff. Joel got a red velvet coat and Bob got a Johnny Cash shirt. And yeah, we were pretty excited. Oh my God. Did you guys have a photo op after changing into all of this grand attire? Yeah, there's pictures of, there's sad pictures of all of us being sad. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Stefan, where does this go out? This goes out to uh, I just all the podcast mediums, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, oh, all that. Yeah. All the What's this ones. one called? This is called a comedy advice podcast. Oh, great. Okay. So essentially, the the um, the guts of the show lie in advice. So we're going to give some advice to questions that people have asked on the internet, just random strangers. Okay. Um, we'll talk about inspirational quotes. And um, we'll have some other segments in there. Just a little positivity with a, a maybe a dash of comedy sprinkled in or a heaping helping of comedy. Right, sprinkled. not just a sous-son. Okay. Yeah, ex exactly. However much you, you're the chef of this podcast. <laughs> I'm the sous chef, so I will just say yes, chef. And uh, we'll, okay. make something, we'll make something beautiful together. So. All right, baby. Tell me awesome. when you're ready. Awesome. All right. I'll just uh, <clears throat> clear. And the we're pipes. plugging who's line or who's live, right? Yes. Yes. So I've got the right thing up here. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And I was going to say, if you have anything else that you'd like to plug your podcast, but oh, okay, great. Um, anything else, happy to plug that as well. I actually um, just. Oh, my book. It's been a while. It, yeah, I just bought it came in yesterday, so I haven't been able to devour it, but I've had some okay. little little niblets of it and it's delicious. So thank you. You're very kind. Oh, absolutely. All right. <laughs> now where are you, Stefan? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, okay. I was born in Phoenix. I, I was going to ask you about that. I didn't know if everybody did, but I saw well, go ahead. On... Let's are we recording now or have we started or Oh yeah, we're recording. We're recording. Oh, okay, groovy. Yeah. No, I was born at Good Samaritan Hospital. My mother was a uh, waitress at the Pink Pony in Scottsdale. And uh, my father was a bartender there. So that's where they met in oh, Scottsdale. Yeah. Okay. And then um, they got married and I was born, oh, I don't know, nine months and like a day after they got married. So. Oh, wow. I was actually, my mom and dad, they worked at Good Samaritan and then I was born at the Pink Pony. So we have a ah. kind of. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, Next to where they overcook steaks. <laughs> yeah, I was not quite well done either. So it was uh, <laughs> a little pink in the middle, but that's great. So you you were in Phoenix for just a little bit before you moved to San Francisco. Is that right? That's right. We we lived in, uh, uh, we moved to Southern California for a couple of years uh, okay. on the desert, a place called Lancaster. And mm -hmm. then, uh, then we moved to the Bay Area when I said, no, I think, what was my sister? She was already, my sister's seven years older than me. Uh, I was, uh, I think, first second grade maybe so that's when we moved to the bay area and then i moved to san francisco after my parents left which was great oh very very okay i see when i was a teen uh, i moved to san francisco i think i was like 19 or something okay and i was going to ask too because i know that 
you are a very good actor, a very good um, improviser. I mean, you've been on Who's Line for the UK and US versions. And I, if Wikipedia is correct, you were the most common fourth chair person in the US version. Well, I've been on the show since 1989. I probably yeah. am, just for sure numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. The ABC show was, what, four years? Then we did like two years on ABC Family, which I think is called Freeform now or something. And then this is our seventh, seventh or eighth season on the CW. Uh, wow. And we haven't shot anything in two years, but we've had two whole new seasons because we shoot so efficiently and our producer is able to get so we've had two new seasons out of the last year i think mm -hmm. we're shooting next year but no one tells me anything so <laughs> it really has been this way for 30 years like literally they'll in the old days the producer used to call me and go look we're shooting in january do you want to come over like that you know, oh so my gosh like it's always like been you... sort of loose like that um wow. and um you know, I, we've done it live in London a bunch of times. I had to miss the last one in 2018 because I had to have eye surgery, but we did it at the Palladium, the Adelphi. And then the one I missed was Royal Albert Hall, sadly, but McShane sat in for me. So, uh, and then of course we've been on the road, me and uh, Ryan mm -hmm. have been on the road for over, oh my God, we started in 99 with Drew. Oh, wow. So our group's been going, oh golly. How long now? What year are we in? So 20, 20 some odd years on the road with Rye and uh, 30 some odd years on the TV show. And of course, I play with Colin and Brad, too, and uh, mm -hmm. all the cats. So uh, and when I'm in England, I play with all those cats because but we had to cancel it last year, obviously, for the plague. Um, right, I was right. I looked at my calendar the other day with my wife and I was kind of depressed because I was like we had two dates at the comedy store with the comedy store players who's mm -hmm. Josie and Richard, you'll know from the English show. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and I was going to do the Soho Theater, do my podcast there. And all, of course, that all went to hell in a handbasket. So mm -hmm. I do see everybody and I'm still mates with everybody. So people ask me and you'll love this, Stefan. Do you miss doing the show? And the answer is no. I don't miss it because we're doing it all the time. We're, before Before the... Uh, pandemic hit we had just done a hundred dates in 2019 and had just done about half a dozen dates in 2020 before we were on our way to do a weekend and we all got on the bus and that's when the governor said no gatherings of over a thousand people and we turned the bus around and came home so oh man i i had heard you say that on another interview and i was mm. like oh man that must have been quite the lunch to just meet up and be like, oh, well, no gatherings over a thousand people. I guess we'll head home. Well, I was on my phone, you know, and Morgan, our tour manager's driving. And we all knew this, you know, we all packed our bags. We went and got Ryan at the airport. We went and got Bob at the hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on my phone on Twitter and the venues started calling in one by one. By the way, we've rebooked at all those venues. It's Escondido, Arroyo Grande, Santa Barbara and Lancaster. And um, we we're going to do a Southern California Mm -hmm. central california thingy and just drive to all the gigs you know and uh mm -hmm. uh they started to shut down one by one you know like the gigs they would call our booking agent and go like well it's over and then about right in about 12 31 in the afternoon governor newsom issued the edict that there'll be no gatherings of a thousand people so i read that to everyone in the bus and we're all like right so we went to lunch. Oh, no. <laughs> we went to lunch in San Diego. I had a fish sandwich. Joel had a hamburger. And uh, mm -hmm. then we got back in the bus. It was pouring rain that day, by the way. And we uh, we drove our ass back. So um, I took all the cookies that we'd bought for the trip. I brought them home. And uh, we haven't been out since. We've done a couple online gigs, but Ryan doesn't love them. So mm -hmm. really waiting to go back on the road. But we have a huge tour planned. Yes. starting at the end of September. We're all over the United States till December. And then we start up again in January and go, because people are writing me all the time. How come you're not in Canada? It's like, we have two and a half weeks in Canada coming up next year. Yeah, we have, I have a sheaf of paper here with dates on it. So it's, mm -hmm. you can't see it because of the internet, but. I, I can feel it though. I feel those <laughs> dates. They are. 
we have like 45 dates this year and then a million dates next year. So we're, we're going back on the road with a vengeance. So hopefully the plague will abate a little by then and people will get vaccinated. So fingers crossed for that. Right? I mean, oh my gosh, I, I hope things clear up and I hope people, um, start to continue to do the right thing hopefully but uh i am i'm really excited for that tour link is going to be in the show notes for all of you listeners out there for all the tour dates it is i think you guys are starting on the east coast you guys are going to be in phoenix or mesa in november if i remember correctly let me see Um, if i can find that yeah we will we're so in phoenix and uh mesa i just tweeted it yesterday because uh there it is we're gonna be oh that's Tucson. Yeah, we're there in November. We're in, let's see, we go to Kansas City, Dallas, Anaheim. We're in Tucson on the 20th, Mesa on the 21st. Oh, very cool. Very so cool. my, I was like, we're all from, you know, I was born in Phoenix, like I say, I still have family, mm-hmm. um, some family there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tucson is a really beautiful gig and we stayed at an awesome hotel there. And then Mesa is that, um, the art center so it's super modern and uh oh, nice. it's a be- great sound and sight lines and everything it's not very old-fashioned but uh uh it's a fun it's a fun gig anyway and usually a bunch of my relatives will sponge off me and come to that one so oh very <laughs> very nice yep we've all got those relatives i might Hi. be the one in my family be like hey can I, uh... <laughs> uh but i know that you had also mentioned that one do you, people ask you, do you get tired? Do you miss the show? No, because I'm doing it all the time. And then you also said, because of the world shutting down, you haven't done it since it's been over a year and a half, almost two years. March 9th now. was our last date. H- how does it feel? Do you feel any sort of nerves getting back into it? Because this, the people that, that you guys play for, the, the quantity is huge and quality. You guys are amazing people that are attending, but um, it's, it's a lot of people. I'm not nervous about performing. I'm nervous yeah. about the travel and going into restaurants and stuff like that because mm. I'm I don't trust um, Americans anymore. Uh, one thing I've learned over the last year and a half is that we're not a trustworthy lot. There's a lot of nice people, there really are, and then there's a lot of real um, people who just don't care about other people at all. And for whatever reason, their yeah. their, their internal pain. Um, that forces them to be the awful human beings that they are. And they don't mm-hmm. want to get vaccinated and they don't want to wear masks and they don't believe in this and they don't believe in that and all that ignorant jazz. And I just, mm-hmm. it, that drives me mad. So, and you know, I'm from Arizona and Arizona is full of lovely people, but the governor and some of the government there is uh, really not that hip. And um, so that's what I'm more nervous about is like, I haven't flown on a plane since March 9th. Uh, so I'm a little trepidatious. I'm not afraid to fly, but, uh, I just Mm -hmm. haven't been in an airport. I haven't been on a plane, any of that. So I have no idea what the new paradigm is. Mm -hmm. And then do I get room service or do I go out and, you know, do I sit outside and eat or do I go inside a restaurant? And, you know, some parts of the country, there was never masking. You know what I mean? Like they just Mm -hmm. ignored it. They just ignored that this existed. It doesn't matter that 600,000 people are gone, anything. They just pretended it's not happening. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like for instance, we're supposed to go to Florida for five, four or five days in December. And that's kind of up in the air, to be honest. I mean, we're planning on going, but you know, (laughs) if it keeps carrying on getting worse there, then that's a reality that we have to deal with. And Florida is a fabulous, see, I don't play that whole red state, blue state thing my family's from mississippi and arizona Mm -hmm. and whatnot Mm -hmm. and you can't just say that everybody in the south is an idiot or something blanketly stupid Um, right there's lovely people everywhere um but we're all not responsible for the people that run this show is how i feel about it yes yes i i agree i agree It, it actually brought me back i flew one time since this all happened for a cousin's wedding and we went to close to yellowstone we went to mm. next to the grand tetons but on the idaho side oh okay and um it was frightening i'm also my wife i have to say was very aware of everything that was going on and when people started when the, there was uh, the reports in China of things happening. She's like, I'm buying masks and she bought them on Amazon. And I remember telling my coworkers and they were saying, oh, pff, what are you doing? And uh, then right. two weeks later, 
done. But um, anyway, to land this plane of conversation, I was thinking of um, actually remembering you talking another time about you were doing stand up at first before you got um, into improv. Then you started doing improv. The audition for the first Who's Line, I think you were in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. That's right. Wow. Well remember. Gee whiz. <laughs> Have you done your research, Stefan? <laughs> Oh, God I mean, I, ha I have to for a fabulous guest such as this is our friend. candy me. Yes, I was in Coeur d'Alene with Tom Kenny, Mr. Square Bob Sponge Pants. And um, uh, my friend nice. McShane called me and said, there's this British show that's auditioning for improv. Uh, it's a TV show. And I uh -huh. literally went back to my room and cried. Oh, and no. then oh. the next year, that was 88. So Muff, uh, McShane got on that year. And then mm -hmm. in 89, they came to San Francisco and I auditioned and I got on. And then I went over in July that year. And then I took my wife over. We did a Christmas show in 89. So those are my first two times in England. And it was a heat wave in London when I went over in 89. And I loved it, you know. And so then we moved mm -hmm. over like in 94. We moved over mm -hmm. like 94 for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. So I lived there for a while. I toured a bunch of times to Edinburgh, all that TV, mm -hmm. radio, all that jazz and Who's Line. People are like, did you move over for Who's Line? Well, we never shot Who's Line for more than a couple of weekends ever. So oh. even when we shoot it in the States, the whole series, it's literally like three or four weekends. It's not it's really not rigorous because we shoot for two or three hours and we play 25, 30 games. And then we boil the games down to 22 because of half hours, 22 and a half minutes mm -hmm, of programming. Mm -hmm. And so with all the intros and outros, it's about 18 minutes, 17, you know, mm -hmm. so we're that's how much programming we're talking about. So if we shoot Man. 28 games and each game's two to three or four minutes, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's yeah. why it's a science. Like our, our producers, when we shot in England in the old days, we'd shoot for three hours and get one show. And then when we came to the States, we'd shoot for three hours and get like five shows, you know, three, four, five shows. So th it changed the dynamic uh, Interesting. Of, of what we can do. Yeah. So people think that I've worked on this like every day of my life. And literally uh, over the last 30 years, I've probably worked a month or two. And <laughs> that's so interesting. And I know that you had mentioned earlier, that's why it seems like seasons and, and new episodes are coming out because you guys had already kind of done that and they've carved those out as as specific episodes yeah Quick. you'll see i'm wearing the same blue suit for the last three years <laughs> and does it get well first question the fatigue does it get tiring for you guys to do so many games and does it get tiring for the audience to be there oh it's horrible um, for the audience people uh, <laughs> people come and they watch it live we do it in front of a live audience that'll be uh -huh. different too like are we going to do it in front of a live audience this year or next year mm -hmm. rather Mm -hmm. Will we will we be at a state where we can have a thousand people in a room, you know, in a studio breathing on each other? Yeah. Will they have to wear masks? Will they have to be vaxxed? Will they, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a dynamic we're dealing with. Um, but yeah, it, it's fun for like the first hour for the audience because mm -hmm. we go full tilt. I mean, we literally go full tilt boogie from the beginning, right? Like mm -hmm. we shoot from the top, right? So the intro is first. And then Aisha comes running down the stairs. Then boom, we go right into a bunch of games. And the first hour we play 10, 12 games, whatever, a bunch of games. And then we take a break and then we come back and play a bunch more games. And then we get up and sit down for camera. And that's the part where the audience is like, what? We didn't think this was coming. And they'll go like, Greg and Wayne, we're going to play props. And so me and Wayne will get up uh -huh. and we'll stand on our mark. And then cut and we go back, sit back down. And that's because we can edit every game with every game. So it's like a little modular, uh, oh. game, you know, uh, building blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So literally we can take any game and put it anywhere with any other game because Aisha or what it was Drew, Drew, when it was Clive, Clive, the, the, we do the intro and the outro every single thing we do so for instance oh. Aisha will go oh we'll be right back after this and then now ryan and colin are gonna so they have to get up and stand where their marks are right uh-huh so now we have an in and out for every single game like we we, we would call it a paper edit right so mm -hmm. 
then our producers after the show's been done will be able to take and go this game fits here this game fits here this game fits here this game fits here and then they can keep doing that with all the games that are left over because we never are lost for you know how like people say when you're shooting a movie and they're shot out and they'll go oh shit we should have go oh i'm assuming to swear we should have done we should have done a cutaway or we should have done a a cover shot Uh uh-huh you know Uh because uh, editing is everything in in television and movies Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to be able to go back to something to move forward in the plot, you know? Mm -hmm. So with our little show, there's always a cover shot, right? There's always the four shot of us or the two shot of the two contestants, or there's an isolated camera on the host at all times. So the host, like I'm looking at you, the host always has this shot. So no matter what happens on earth, you can always go back to, (laughs) we'll be right back. (laughs) <laughs> or ha, 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 now it's time to play this game, right? Because that shot is eternal. That shot's oh. always there. So that's how we make the show. People go, do you just do stuff until it's funny? No, we get up and we play the game. And because I've mm-hmm. got Ryan and Colin and Wayne there, I've got the three best improvisers in the world. Mm-hmm. We play the game for a couple of minutes. If it doesn't work, we stop and we start mm-hmm. it again, right then and there. There's no, no half hour games. Every mm-hmm. game is this long. And because Ryan and Colin and Wayne and me, we're all in it, you know, we go boom, 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 boom with the jokes. So uh, there's none of that goofing around. It's really, I don't want to say military, but it's professional, you know, like Mm -hmm. uh, on stage, of course, it's different on stage. We'll goof around and we mess with each other, but we do anyway in the studio. We really do flip each other off and we make fun of the producer and we spit water (laughs) on each other and all that stuff. But but the the shooting of it is much more technical than people are ready for. So the third hour, you, now you've been sitting there for two hours. Now you laughed, you've cried, you've seen right. us sing, you've seen us dance, and now you're watching us get up and sit down. And so the last hour, people are like, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> it's, I always feel sorry for the audience to laugh because it's literally, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then, yeah, hour, oh. an hour of it, an hour of it, because we have to have these edit points. Without yeah. doing that, we would have no way to construct. I see. So this is, I mean, you know, I'm not letting you into our catching here because people go, well, it's edited so they cut out all the parts that don't work. It's like, uh, duh, it's television. Television's magic. But the truth right. is, we don't know what we're going to say, and we really are improvising. So the magic really mm-hmm. is there. We do make mistakes. We swear. We fall over each other. We trip on words. We All the things that can happen, happen. And um, some of them are left in, and some of them are taken out. Like I say, if the bit just eats, if it's really eating and it's not working at all, we stop mm-hmm. immediately and mm-hmm. start it again and then make it work. Mm-hmm. So you're actually getting almost everything other than the swearing. That is so cool. Uh, and then flipping each other off and all that. You're getting everything that we shoot. We don't we don't leave a lot on the table, as it were, or in the can. That would be, I mean, I don't know how much money could be made if you guys have the bonus features of you guys just swearing and flipping each other off. But well, I would they pay used for to that. show them, you know, there's <laughs> one of me with a fish head on swearing from 20 years ago and stuff, but <laughs> we're, we don't swear that. I mean, occasionally we say something disgusting and it doesn't get in, but uh, <laughs> right, right. Generally, I- it, you know, like I said, you're you're working with guys who just don't fail. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I um I also I had the pleasure of speaking with Brad on an episode and Colin oh, Brad, yeah. on another episode, and and Colin specifically was talking about that where he was saying, you know, we will. I mean, you're really getting everything, and we intentionally we won't we'll try not to swear, we'll try not to do something vulgar where we think that it'll get censored out. And he was talking a little bit about the differences between um, the UK and and the US as well, and how the US a little bit more um, uh, sensitive to certain topics. Um, but but I also to that point, and and I know that you know, completely unscripted and improv, you also are very talented about doing semi-scripted stand-up. And I I feel that you're really good. I know that you have toured 
almost everywhere in so many different countries. And um, I, you're really good about pinpointing these um, idiosyncrasies or these these differences between countries. I remember watching this clip on the Just for Laughs Festival where you were in Quebec. I think they speak French there and you come up and je m'appelle Gregoire and then you yeah. call them poutine eaters. And then you talk about uh, you talk about soccer. You talk about the difference. There's this really good line, too, where you're talking about the the uh, Brits. They don't really like to talk about or do sex, just like Americans don't like to talk or do about reading. And I thought I, I butchered that. And I'm sorry that I spoiled. Yeah, no, it, that's, but... that's the joke. Yeah. It was it was very good and and I think raccoons at one point and and uh, so it's it's very very talented and I feel um, you may earn you may have earned your smartest man in the world title for many reasons that uh, one of which where I feel like you're able to just take these observations um, wherever you go from all of your experiences and you're able to put them on the stand up side uh, as well and and make me chuckle heartily from afar so well thank you it's that you know going to england was a real education for me when i first went <laughs> and after playing on the road there for a year mm -hmm. uh, i learned how to handle myself in another country and then you know you just start going to other places and you realize they want you to talk about them a little bit but they also mm -hmm. want your american viewpoint you can't yeah. be one of them which is something i learned early on my wife said <laughs> I was starting to pick up a British accent when we first lived there. And she's like, down. It's like, they don't want you to be British. That's not why you're here. And I was like, you're right. Um, Did, how, she noticed how when Madonna lived in England, all of a sudden she had like an English accent and stuff. And it was like, that can happen to you because you could just pick it up. Uh -huh, and she was uh -huh. right. So I've always tried to maintain my accent. But yeah, the, one of the great pieces of fortune I've had in my life after who was getting on his line and then being able to go around the world because of it. I mean, we've been to India and, uh, you know, to Scandinavia, England, Scotland, Ireland, Australia, you know, everywhere mm -hmm. because of it really. So mm -hmm. I couldn't be luckier in that regard. That's and then good. like, you know, I'm in nightmare before Christmas, which Danny Elfman uh, does live with a live symphony orchestra and and before the plague hit in 2019, mm -hmm. we did Tokyo, Dublin, Glasgow, and London in 2019. And because of whose line, when we played Dublin and Glasgow and London, <laughs> you know, they'd introduce everybody and the orchestra would be there and they go, and Greg Proops is here and I'd stand up and the orchestra would go, yay. And I thought, well, they're all, you know, 30 something, 40 something. Uh -huh. people. And then, of course, they grew up watching the show. So. Nice. I had that advantage. That that's super cool, and it's something that when I started doing delving deeper into the Proopsiverse, where I that's one of my favorite shows, the uh, Nightmare Before Films, Nightmare Before yes. Christmas, and and you had done multiple characters on the movie too. I think it was Satan. The I can't remember what he's called, the but the Harlequin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and were you one of the only? voices or one of the only actors that weren't classically or not classically i'm sorry but trained at singing or a professional yeah. singer me and me and debbie durst uh okay. who's one of my best buddies will durst wife from san francisco she's a comedian and uh -huh. her and me were the only ones who weren't um singers uh everyone else was a voice uh, or could sight read mm -hmm. they're professional singers who do jingles the oscars all that stuff wow uh the only one from the cast that still does the live one is randall crenshaw Okay. Randy's still in the cast. And of course, Catherine O'Hare and, and Danny. Um, I would, I don't know that Catherine's, a, but her, her sister's a professional singer, isn't she? Uh, so mm -hmm. we got in because of our funny voices. And uh, Danny told me as much. And, you know, and then in Dublin last year, him and me were having a drink. And he said, I wanted you in the show because of the texture of your voice. So you were saying uplifting quotes and uh, bromides and maxims. Oscar Wilde said, your weaknesses are your strengths. So people always said, oh, your voice is effeminate and nasal. Uh, you should really work on it. But the truth is, I would never have been in Nightmare Before Christmas if I didn't sound like this. So that's so cool. Uh, and it worked out. So, yeah, uh, no, everybody else can sight read. So when they hand us sheet music, which they do, I have the libretto here somewhere. Uh -huh. uh, I have. Ow! Oh, have, are you okay? 
Yeah, I just rolled over my foot. Oh um, no. Yeah, I'll be all right. Uh, the uh, I hope I you signed a waiver. Not your. I, I I'm not responsible. Home. Yeah. Oh, I think it's in another cabinet. But anyway, I have the uh, the music somewhere. There's a sheet music book, you know, like the the book of the of the musical. Uh-huh. And uh, of course, I had Danny autograph it because I'm, you know, a geek. And uh, <laughs> but when I could be looking at it and just be like, I don't know what it says, you know. Mm-hmm. And whereas all the singers look at it and it's like the Rosetta Stone to them, mm-hmm. you know what yeah. they're supposed to do and where they come in. So I just turn to the other singers and go, Do I come in here? Inter- and you they'll know- be like, Yeah, sing there, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you pick up your cue? Greg? <laughs> so I'm singing professionally and I can't really sing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can, but not, I don't know what note I'm singing or anything like that. And uh, right. But That's fortunately, true. it's a lot of monster voices. And then we've redistributed the voices for the live show. Mm-hmm. So I'm not only am I doing the ones I did in the movie, but I'm doing a bunch of other ones too because we're covering for. There's five of us that are principal singers. And then Ken Page still, I don't, see, we're doing it this year in um, LA at the Bank of California Stadium on the 29th of October. And then my guess is we'll probably do Halloween as well. Um, but I don't know if Catherine and Ken and, and Paul Rubin are doing it, but we have done it with all of them in the past. So Catherine didn't come to Japan, but she came to England and Dublin and Glasgow and so did Ken Page, who does Oogie Boogie. So it's fantastic. I mean, to have them get up and sing their numbers, you know, everybody loves it. The crowd goes bananas. That is so cool. I would definitely be among that bunch of bananas because... It's so much fun, Stefan. It's the most... I cry laughing through the whole thing. I really do. My wife will tell you it's like... Like, I get to do a lot of fun gigs, but that one Uh makes me happy. Really, really genuinely happy. Oh. And everyone couldn't be nicer. And John No Cherry is our conductor, and he tells us stories about Leonard Bernstein and stuff because he was Bernstein's protege. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing to sing with a symphony orchestra. Is, uh, I'll, I mean, I'm never going to be in an opera or anything. So it's like, it's as close as I'm going to get. So anytime I can do it, I'm pretty happy to do it. Oh my gosh. That is, that's so cool. And it, is. It, it's, I'm going to try and articulate a segue, but let's see how it goes. All right. The, uh, Good just luck. all, thank you. I think all of the things that we've talked about, d- you know, doing stand up, um, improv, whose line, um, singing with Sync- uh, symphony orchestra and, and going into all of these different things where some people, maybe not all, but some people might just choose one journey and go there. And we didn't even talk about the further voice acting. I know you were Bob the Builder. Um, you were the Bob and you've been in Star Wars, uh, I think multiple um, roles there too. Uh, but, I, and and then also the podcast and the book where I, f- I feel, I might make an assumption here, but it seems like you have kind of just followed your passions your curiosity and it's it's led you to some amazing places that may have not necessarily been planned but um they have you you met each other almost in the middle where it's it's you worked hard you put in the passion and and all the work and and these opportunities um came to you and it 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 seems very inspiring to me maybe you're like you're 100 percent wrong steph and this is how it is but uh, i i kind of live my life like that and i feel i i looked up to your story as i was researching it where um i learned i i speak italian and a lot of my listeners might not know that but i went to school for languages and learned italian i lived over in italy for about six months because i thought it was a cool language i thought there was a quote from Homer um, that was, when you learn another language, you gain another soul. Mm. And I, not not from the Simpsons, Homer, but... Yes, you know, uh, the poet so, Homer. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, so I thought that was really cool, and I got to meet a lot of cool people. Then I ended up being a teacher for a little while, teaching Italian. Um, and then I started getting into voice acting, and that's when I started getting into podcasting, and I started getting into comedy and all these things. And these things kind of came up on my journey. And so I feel like you have been in this this really um, cool journey that it's been, I'm sure, very fun to do and be on, but also fun from the sidelines for me to to watch. 
I don't know if that was a well, question. <laughs> that's very kind of you. I, I'm very impressed you speak Italian and that you went to Italy. It's the one thing I wish I'd done two things in my life. I wish I'd learned an instrument and I wish I'd learned it, uh, a foreign mm. language. Mm. And Italian is really useful because if you speak Italian, you can kind of speak Spanish and you can kind of understand Portuguese. And, you know, yes, having that yes. Latin background really lets lets you into a bunch of other languages. Uh, yeah. So it's I think that's fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I, I really had no plan. I've just been a you know, wandering around the world doing this. And I got really lucky on the things I got in mm -hmm. because believe me, show business is, you know, a bummer in a lot of ways. And they'll just tell you no all the time. So the things that I got told yes on, I got inconceivably lucky on like who's line and star Wars and nightmare because mm -hmm. they're things people really like too. So no one like when they see me, they don't openly hate me because they're like, Oh, right. You're on that thing. I liked <laughs> So there's a big advantage to that too, as opposed to being a tax collector your whole life or a investment bank or something. Yes, yes, yes. I, what did uh, David Hockney say? No one on their deathbed goes, God, I wish I'd been a banker. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, well, I think is... you have to follow what you want to do and be creative. Some people don't have it in them, obviously, and other people, whatever. But uh, the, right. I, yeah, business is never... Sadly, because I would have more money if I was a good businessman. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, well, Greg, we're gonna we're gonna wind down and give okay. some advice. Um, but before we do, there's a segment where I like to ruminate on some inspirational quotes. So I've got a quote in my pocket that I'll I'll pu I'll pull out. But I like to ask my guests if they have any inspirational quotes that they cling to when. They're having a down day when maybe they're about to go on a tour on a bus and they f they find out that you can't do it and they have to turn back and take all the cookies. I don't know. Is there anything, Greg, that you might well uh, cling several? To? I think of several things. Um, first of all, about other people. Mm -hmm. I think it was Maya Angelou who said, "When people show you who they are the first time, believe them." So uh, when Ooh. You see someone and you think they're being, uh, let's say, not altogether wholesome or even openly evil. Mm -hmm. It's not an unfair assumption to presume that that's how they operate all the time. Uh, my wife often says to me, um, when we like do a podcast somewhere and they like, what is this? And what do you need? And why is it like this? And what are we doing? Mm -hmm. She goes, if they don't get it, at the beginning, they're never going to get it. You're never going to be able to convince them or explain to them why the podcast is important, why it's what it is, or why it's important to you or anything. They're stuck in the thing they're doing. So I think yeah. that's an important quote too. Like, you know, if, if people don't get you the first time in, sometimes they'll learn, but a lot of times it's because they're already stuck in the horrible thing that they're doing and they don't. But the other one is Winston mm -hmm. Churchill, who that, that great imperialist and racist, <laughs> and um, also a, a historian and painter, as well as prime minister, mm -hmm. uh, said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Uh, and I think that's kind of a and then a comedian said to me in 1982, a fellow who's no longer with us named Warren Spotswood, mm -hmm. Warren Spotswood. We were all upstairs at the Holy City Zoo, which was a famous comedy club in San Francisco that mm -hmm. Robin started out and everybody. Mm -hmm. Me, too, because I'm from then. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, uh, never quit. Take a year off if you have to, but don't tell everyone you're quitting and, and then come back to it because this, what it, the craft is, you know, a thing. You can mm -hmm. stop being an artist for six months a year or whatever, but don't quit and don't tell everyone you're quitting, you know, like stay yeah. with it because uh, perseverance is, maybe 95% of everything. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who said it, but uh, showing up, showing up is a good deal of the game. And Robert mm -hmm. Forster, the late actor who was so brilliant said, um, and I'm going to tell I'm going to mangle this quote. <laughs> Always oh, something about like, you're going to get a chance. Finally, when you get a chance to get in front of the people that you need to, Make mm -hmm. sure that you do the best you can at that moment. Like be be as good as you can. Don't go, oh shit, it came to oh blah blah blah. You know, try to marshal in yourself the moment so that you're 
good when you have the chance to be good in front of the people you need to, which is not always easy to do because we're always in our own way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with insecurities, with anger, with jealousy, all those things that come into our lives. But I think he's right about that. If you're a trombone player and they give you a chance to play for the New York symphony and you get that audition, that's the time to do what you do. Don't think about other things like, oh, I wished I'd done this earlier or why aren't they nicer or I didn't like my dressing room or, you know, try to let all that go and sort of focus on what it is you're yes. doing. Yes. Uh, but I think perseverance is really, I started in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And I've seen a lot of comedians that I started with. Um, some went on to be producers and writers mm-hmm. and stopped doing comedy. And some went on to carry on doing comedy and some just don't do any comedy anymore. They just fell by the wayside or they chose to make another life. And I was never going to do that. I didn't have a plan B. So Mm -hmm. I feel like if, you know, I meet young comedians and they'll say, what about my career? And I'll go, you don't have a career. You know, you're too young. You need to focus on what you're doing and make that, make that the focus of what, um, you know, I don't think any of us sit around in our group and think, oh, how can we make our career better by doing improv? We think, how can we do the show good tonight? What can we make better for tomorrow? How can we make this part work and that part work? And that's mm-hmm. sort of where we're, what we talk about. We don't really go, God, our careers are going to dig. I mean, we're, you know, we're old. So <laughs> there's, there's no point in, <laughs> all right, that was a long convoluted answer i was hoping to give you a really punchy succinct answer but hey you know you know what it was still a meaty stew of of sage (laughs) wisdom i mean man that i might have to sit on that one for a while because that that was a lot of really really good stuff i think the thing that stood out to me the most was really where we get caught up in all of our other thoughts when we're presented this grand opportunity and we really should just be focusing on what we're what we're there to do and it ha- i will be the first one to admit that that happens to me a lot but i've started to get a little bit better at it and i've started to actually enjoy myself whether it's getting up on stage doing stand up or uh, podcasting or you know uh, telling my wife that i'm sorry it all as scary as it is at first i i'm able to just think about what i'm going to do and i go do it and and it's it's really helpful so it is uh the extraneous uh, emotional baggage is always the hobgoblin of little minds as they say the other thing i would say uh, for your people who are listening is everyone's going to tell you no they really are um -hmm. i've been told no a million times i've been fired for a dazzling variety of reasons i've been let Mm -hmm. go i've been told it wasn't going to be me i was too i wasn't i'm not kidding i wasn't tall enough i wore glasses uh, the way I sound, um, I talked about politics. All these reasons have been given to me for not giving me a gig. So p- keeping that in mind, y- you mustn't listen to any of that. You have to, like you said, f- get to the matter at hand. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As, uh, as Polonius, that great charlatan says to Hamlet, to thine own self be true. And there's a real lot in there. It's like, uh, if you're a woman performer, there's a million things going on, even more than men. Yeah. Uh, they're going to say you're fat. You you we already have a blonde. I'm not kidding. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. You're not good looking enough. You're too good looking. Oh my god. Uh, women aren't funny. Oh. That happens a lot in comedy, um, and and so you really have to just have that kind of steel uh, to push on. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I try to have only women comedians on stand-up shows that I'm doing, and I have for the last few years. I'm not the only one, by the way. I believe Anthony Jesselnik does it as well. There's mm-hmm. a few comics, but I got really tired of playing with other men all the time. Not because I hate men, but right. it, a stand-up show shouldn't be three guys talking about their knobs for an hour and a half. <laughs> yes. Stand-up show needs to have some breadth and scope to it. And when you add yeah. women, and especially women who aren't white women, when you add some uh, uh variety to the package then you're getting a more real representation of what comedy can be so yes. i 
the bummer for me always in comedy was that it's so, so white guy. Um, and I know I'm a white guy and I'm looking at a group here full of white guys, but, <laughs> yes, but here too. Right. Present. But within that, I think you can still aspire to. Yeah. No, I'm the ethnic one in our group. We have <laughs> nothing but Welsh, Irish, Scottish, Irish, <laughs> and troops. And troops. <laughs> oh man oh gosh that is hilarious yeah That's... we're white <laughs> man well thank you greg that was a pleasure whole, a whole bundle like a picnic basket of inspirational quotes so that was great i'll read mine very quickly and then we can Please. go into a question from the internet but this uh oh, this yeah. quote i think it's important to state where this comes from this is not by any person whatsoever this is actually by a robot and its name is Inspirobot. So its its creator used programmed it to use AI to go and just delve into uh, the earliest to the most modern works of man in written form, say the Torah, the uh, New York Times, Bitcoin receipts. And it just goes and takes those words and binary numbers and puts them together for an inspirational quote. Wow. <laughs> yes. So we'll see. I'll read this one and we can ruminate to see if it means anything. Um, Inspired about this week says, don't say, see if I care. Say instead, fondle my buttocks. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Man, always, always a popular item. <laughs> that is uh, that is very true. Um, I... <laughs> I think uh, now that we're nice and now that we've we've gone to the top of the inspiration uh, funnel, I think it's it's time to get into questions here, Greg. Yes, so we'll we'll finish this off with a couple questions. The first one is, how can I better support my family and friends who are pregnant? I am child free and people in my life are starting to have children. At best, I am completely indifferent. And at worst, I'm resentful. They are bringing that child into my life, too, which I don't especially want. What can I do to be more supportive? I'm happy that they are excited, but I don't share that excitement, so I don't know what to do or say. Hmm. Well, that's a constant dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, People are right. always breeding, and then they um, lay a bunch of uh, trips on you. Like, you don't... The one that uh, we always get is, um, oh, well, you don't have any children, so, <laughs> you know, you're not fully human. You don't really have the experience of a human has, right? What? Uh, that you need to have children in order to feel humanity. Um, and then the other one is, oh, well, you don't have kids. So, you know, right? Like basically that we're kamikazes and our life is just a, a heedless headlong dive into oblivion simply because we don't have kids, even though people in LA have kids so that they can go to the right school or meet show business people i swear to you oh my god so to answer the question um i think once the kids uh, become a little more interesting and they can talk and you know you see their personality i think then you'll find that you, that's where your connection will be that they they really are worth it and every every child is a different individual and they tend to be a lot more surprising than you think they're going to be and uh, they they'll they'll have something to give so i think that that's where you need to jump in and uh, uh I if I you're like going that. to try to be a part of their life, you might want to, I mean, you know, I have relatives and uh, I'm not always there for them. And I've been traveling around the world for a thousand years, so I'm not exactly available. And I said to one of my nieces once, uh, I wish I'd been there more for you. And she went, it's okay. You're the cool uncle. Huh? So I've tried to hold on to that because rather than feeling guilty about never being there, when I do see her occasionally, at least she thinks I'm fun. That... <clears throat> I love that. I like all of what you said too. Because my my wife and I, we've been married for eight years, and we don't have any children, and we aren't planning on having any children, possibly ever. Sorry, mom, if you're listening to this. Yeah. But yeah, that that the you don't understand. You don't have kids. Um, you know, so uh, that that constantly comes up to us. Also, I like the you know kind of invest in the kid like a Roth. 
or 401k where a couple of years down the line <laughs> they'll be they'll be worth talking to once they can get a solid premise and punchline you know if they've got some jokes in them or right. or, or something <laughs> that no, would be great true. they'll always surprise you you know uh, uh, and also you have to kids are often better than their parents which is a, a real bonus yes yes that's true so you'll be you like can... Ugh, your dad Ugh. <laughs> And then you're like, oh, you're not so bad. I mean, people have said that to me about my parents, like your parents. Wow. How come you're, you know, like have feelings and stuff? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. I unfortunately, they're like that son of yours. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the other way around. But, you know, I do what I can. I do what I can. All right. So we've got this last question, Greg. I think that was beautifully answered, by the way. Thank you. Um, this one says, should I friend zone my fiance? My fiance and I get along great, but I realized recently I'm not physically attracted to him and a few smaller issues he has. It's causing me to not see him as a significant other and just as a friend. Should I call it off and friend zone him? Well, I, uh, friend zone is not something I use as frequently, but if, if you're not physically attracted to someone and you're thinking about making a life with them, yeah, you might want to break that off. I, I don't. I don't think you can... Yeah. I'm not a big believer in opposites attract, but I'm also not a big believer in slogging through your entire life with someone, <laughs> you know, and making a huge compromise. Uh, right. My wife right. and I get along. I mean, we obviously fight like all human beings, but, but we agree with each other on politics. We agree with each other on uh, enough things that that's why we're connected. So, mm. and you have to be able to laugh at the same things. If you think something's funny and your significant other doesn't get it at all, that is, uh, wow, I don't see how that goes forward. But not being physically attracted to someone, because you have to think about 20 years down the line on this, you know, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. eight years down the line or whatever. So, yeah, I would, uh, uh, friend zone is an interesting way of putting it. I, I would sideline them entirely. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's, a <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, I'm not a big believer in, being friends with everyone you ever were in a relationship with. I think you, I think you compartmentalize and move on. That's, so. that's what I think. I mean, the, the few exes that I have had the opportunity of being scarred from, I did not friend zone them. They would be out of the life because I just thought about the future and I thought it would be weird if I'm still friend friends with with uh you know Jackie or whoever and then I introduce her to my new girlfriend and then that causes a, an issue so and I don't think I think if you guys got to the level of fiance I don't know if he or she would like to be friends with you anymore after this so no I think clean. you cut that off and start again Clean break. Like you Clean. say, there's the, the whole introducing people to, you know, you can, you can be friendly. Yes. Be courteous, uh, be polite. Right. And, and genial and, and all that. But as far as keeping them intimate and close, not, no. not for me. No. Yeah. Not flee, the, flee the country if you can. I right. Mean, just, Assu just... Assume another identity. Move to <laughs> in <laughs> whatever it takes i mean it's the problem is for women guys never let go you know like if she wants to friend zone this guy he might be like eight years from now like oh god i still love you and it's like no you don't you're just a mess you know yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i've just been stringing you along here uh, yeah all right well what a beautiful maybe we have landed ourselves in the friend zone greg because this is a wonderful time on a comedy advice podcast thank you so much for joining first off and second off uh oh did oh you're listening intently i'm sorry i thought you froze for a second you were no no i'm just actually intently listening oh i'm so sorry i broke the the moment right? but i want <laughs> i wanted to ask what what have you got going on what would you like to plug where can people follow you all that good stuff Thank you, Stefan. I'm at G Proop Dog on Instagram. I'm at Greg Proops on Twitter. I have a new podcast out uh, yesterday that I did on my own on Friday. My wife and I put one out last Thursday. So there's actually kind of two new ones out. Um, mm -hmm. And that's free. It's at gregproops.com. Um, and that's the smartest man in the world podcast. And then uh, uh, let's see, I've got a stand up show on the 27th. That's a Zoom show. Uh, so that'll oh. be over the interweb. I'll be doing that from my home. And then 
uh, September 17th, I'm in Parker, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver, playing the Parker Art Center. So you can come see me there. And then uh, August 24th, the Greg Proops Film Club reconvenes. We had to, we haven't shown a film since the first week of March in 2020. Um, my wife, Jennifer, curates the film club, and we're going to show Mr. Hulo's Holiday uh, here in Los Angeles at a really groovy theater called the Los Feliz Three which is in the swanky hipster neighborhood of Los Feliz, right in the heart of the street where all the hipster stuff is. That'll be the 24th. Um, it's a French film from the 50s. It's very funny. Mm. And then what else is, oh, Who's Line Goes Back on the Road, or Who's Live, as you can see. There's Jeff, Joel, Ryan, and me. Uh, September 29th, we're one. in, where are we? Northampton? No. Yeah, I think we start in, wait a minute, I'll look. I think we start in Northampton, Mass., yeah, it was I our first so gig too. but it might be somewhere else yeah the 29th were in northampton mass which is a fantastic place the whiskey rebellion took place there and uh, it's very witchy oh. it's like you could if you celebrate beltane you could so have a great time in northampton mass they had witch trials there it's super lesbianic witchy there now which i really appreciate Oh. Then we're going to P Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, back to Boston, Maine, of all places. We're doing the whole East Coast. And then after we do the East Coast, we go to the Midwest. And then after the Midwest, back to Southern California and then Arizona. Uh, that's uh, on and on and on. And that's who's live.com. Who's live. See what we did? We okay. changed the name of the live show to who's live anyway. I so like that's it. all got going on, uh, all those things. And uh, oh, and Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, that's a, a, I think, Ticketmaster and stuff like that. Bank of California Stadium is in Los Angeles, down near uh, the University of Southern California. Mm -hmm. It's across from, they built a stadium across from the Los Angeles Coliseum, which you see in loads of movies. That's also where they had the 1932 Olympics. It's that, you know, beautiful Art Deco stadium. Mm -hmm. Across from that stadium. Uh, what do we say? Stadia for the plural. Uh, there's the bank. And that's where they play football here in LA. I mean, uh, soccer uh, oh. in Los Angeles. So, uh, and that's the October 29th. And that's a full symphony orchestra. Danny Elfman will be singing Jack Skellington. I'll be there doing my monster voices. I don't know if Catherine and Ken are there. So don't hold me to that. That'll nice. probably get announced coming up. And then possibly Halloween as well. My guesses will do Halloween. Very. So that's that's what I got going on, baby. Well, very exciting. It's a it's a Greg Proops live performance Proopissance because right. coming co coming back and coming back hot. That's amazing. And all of for all of you listeners are like, wait, I'm writing all this down. I can't. Don't. What are you doing writing anyway? And two, it's going to be in the show notes, so you can just click on those links with your thumb or your mouse or your tongue. I mean, it doesn't matter. Whatever the touch <laughs> sensor accepts, and it'll be there. So awesome, Greg. Thank you one more time. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yes, looking forward to seeing you perform in Phoenix. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And uh, th Stefan, thank you for uh, having me on your show. Good luck to you and your, and your marriage. And uh, buona fortuna, as they say. Oh, grazie mille. Thank you yeah, so right? much. Prego. <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, thanks for having me on. It was great fun. And that's the episode. We have reached the end. We went to the climax and now we're the Snorlax, because we're about to snooze. But before you snooze, I hope you do's go over and support Greg. Give him a follow. Go see him live. Listen to the podcast. All that good stuff. Okay? Please do that for me. And then while you're at it, before you hit the lights and go into your slumber, follow me, support me, subscribe, leave a review, follow me on Instagram, and comment dm whatever you want to do say hi and i'll say hi back see me live as well jp's comedy club 26th through the 28th that's this week y'all this week and come say hi after the show and trash or treasure september 8th wednesday 7 30 p.m link in the show notes for all of that good stuff so thank you guys so much big old gooch smooch bye-bye